Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really mean that. I think it's a good idea to sleep in a bed at least once every three or four nights as opposed to an airplane. This is my fourth outlook, um, and I'm not getting any better at it, I must admit. It's a long way to come. But I guess you know all about that, right? Um, I'm going to uh, uh, try and talk a little bit more about the policy side of the story. I'm not going to provide uh, you with yet more forecasts. Um, I need to reveal my bias. I'm much more optimistic, at least I was before I came here, um, about commodity markets than I've heard this morning. Uh, but I also think there's uh, a good dose of urgency that needs to be entered uh, into, into this particular debate. Um, just very briefly, these are essentially the same numbers that David shared with you. Um, uh, presented slightly differently. Uh, there has been a significant progress in reducing the prevalence of undernourishment around the world, uh, despite uh, some price increases that we've seen recently. There's been a slowing, but there's continued progress. And I guess the, the point I want to make is that th the issue of global food security is not an issue of supply, and it's not an issue of price. It's an issue of income. People are hungry because they're too poor to buy food. There's about 850 million people hungry today. It's about the same number as in 2000, when prices were at historical lows in real terms. So if you accept that the issue is not supply, not prices, but poverty, then this, it has important implications, obviously, for the solution. And if people are too poor to be able to buy food, then perhaps we ought to do something about reducing poverty around the world. This is comprehensive, widespread, inclusive economic development. It is not just development within agriculture. Of course, because so many of the hungry are in developing countries and, in fact, live on farms, Improving agricultural performance is a part of the solution, but it's an income generation part of a solution, our evidence would suggest, rather than one of simply supply or trying to drive down prices. Now, I want to say just a word about addressing the poverty challenge. I think it's it should be clear to all of us that the basic ingredients are well known, but of course the recipe is not. And the recipe varies by country, by stage of development, by natural resource endowments, and so on. And I'm not going to go through each of these. I just want to highlight the importance of effective structural policies in the area of health, education, and labor market policies that need to be equally accessible to girls and women as they are to boys and men. And the other aspect of getting what David referred to as the enabling conditions right, getting the framework, the economy-wide policy conditions in place that would allow for multiple paths for development. It's not just about developing any given sector. It's about creating economic opportunities and expanding choices for families, rural families and urban families, to do whatever they want to do, whether that's to stay in agriculture or to move on to something where the remuneration is better. Now let me come back to the issue of improving agricultural performance. Jamie assumed that we would eliminate all support and open markets. I'm not going to assume, but I'm going to try and build a stronger case for doing at least some of that. Now, the challenge to agriculture, you're all familiar with this. All you need to do is produce more feed and food and fuel in an environment of higher but more volatile prices on roughly the same land, probably less water, and at the same time deal with the uncertain but net, probably negative impacts of climate change. So that's very much, I think, a recipe for, as you've heard today, for focusing on productivity growth, for focusing on sustainable resource use, and for building the resilience of agriculture. 
Now, what are our current policies? And here I'm showing a selection of OECD countries. What are our current policies doing in this respect? Now, you all understand that support to agriculture across the OECD region is relatively high. There's been a tremendous amount of reform in the past decade or two in many, many countries. But protect, protection levels and support levels remain relatively high, and I'm not going to talk about them at all. I'm going to talk about the kinds of things that governments spend their money on, the kinds of efforts that governments make to support and develop agriculture. So if your budget is one dollar or your budget is a million dollars, I'm just going to look at the relative effort. And what we show here is in some countries, particularly high support countries, it continued very high reliance on support to producers that's linked directly to production. So essentially maintaining high prices behind relatively high tariff and other border protections. That's what you see here in the case of Japan and Korea. There is a significant amount in some countries of what we refer to as other support to producers. And this essentially is not production linked, it's much more decoupled kinds of support, income transfers to producers. And here you see a very high reliance on this kind of support in the European Union. And then there's a category of support that we label here productivity enhancing services. So this is public investment in R&D, uh, education, extension, food inspection, quality assurance, and so on. That's reflected in the green bar. And then there's some other services that essentially in this slide reflect consumer subsidies and the big, I guess that's purple, uh, bar is the food stamp program and some other consumer support programs in the United States. So just like in the WTO you want to see green box support here on this graph, I think I'd like to see more green bar support. And you see across the OECD countries on average, and in many of the countries shown here, the relative proportion of effort on productivity enhancing services is modest. In less developed countries, agriculture for a long time has been taxed. The support has been negative, in fact. Now that's changing, and more recently we're seeing higher levels of support in many less developed economies, but that support in very general terms, tends to be more rather than less linked to production and factors of production. So with that picture, and again, you've seen some of the, the, the trends in, in, in yields. This is looking from the left to the right, um, the trends in world crop yields for the selection of crops that are shown here from the early 60s to, to recent years. I just want to illustrate the relatively declining rate of performance. So I think all this says that business as usual is not going to get us to where we want to be. That policies that many of which were introduced post-war, they're many decades old, need to realign with a new market reality, need to realign with what I think is a much more upbeat market outlook than I've heard this morning. Yeah, prices in real terms are relatively flat, maybe increasing a little bit, depending on the commodity. That's a long way from the last 100 years when prices in real terms were declining pretty steadily. And I think most of the risk is on the upside. The shocks that you, we might anticipate are probably going to put upward pressure on prices rather than downward pressure. So I think there's a compelling case to be made and an urgent case to be made to move away from traditional commodity type support programs to allow market signals, the positive market signals, to actually make it uh, to farmers. So that means increasing trade openness and then investing so that farmers have the means to respond to those positive market signals. I think most of us understand open economies grow faster than closed economies. There is no exception. We've done a lot of work on this issue with a lot of other IOs, a lot of other international organizations, my apologies for the acronym, over the last few years. There is no evidence of an economy that's grown faster by being closed than by being open. And we understand that on the export side. 
economies of scope and scale, bigger markets, and so on. We don't seem to understand it on the import side. Most trade today is not in consumer products. It's in intermediate inputs. It's firms buying things to which they can add value and then sell either in domestic markets or export markets. We need to open our input, our import markets, as well as our export markets. Now, how are we doing on that score? This is a, this is a sneaky graph. I should just take a moment. You're, you're not seeing what you probably think you're seeing. These are not the tariffs levied by the countries listed here. These are the average applied tariffs calculated in the subsectors and the target markets of those countries. So these are the, the tariff levels that are faced by these countries. And the only message I want to leave with you from this particular graph is that countries, no matter where they trade, face higher tariffs on agriculture than on manufacturing. Now, this is really a high risk. I don't know if I can explain this in a minute or two, but I'm gonna give it a try. We have at the OECD with the WTO been trying to unpack gross trade flows that are expressed in gross terms and to identify the value that's added by individual countries as products move around the world in supply chains. So what we're trying to do is distinguish an estimate of a gross trade flow from an estimate of the income generated by a country in exporting. So if Australia imports seed from the United States, we take that out of the value of your exports. We do this for all industries and for 57 countries, a little over 95% of global output. And the message I want to leave, as high as we have always understood support and, and, and protection to be in agriculture, when you measure the costs of tariffs relative to the domestic value added of your exports, it's even higher. So in other words, the cost of protectionism and the benefits of opening markets are much greater than any of us has understood. There's much more to this story, but I don't really have time to tell it, so I better move on. A second piece of information that I think we understand, but it needs to be, it needs to be kept, I think, a little bit more to the front part of our brains. In addition to tariffs, in addition to the reality that goods and services are crossing borders many, many times, they're encountering customs procedures. And we've estimated for 133 countries around the world the cost of various categories of customs procedures and contrasted those procedures, those administrative activities relative to what's possible in a set of best practice, quote unquote, countries. Our estimate is that unnecessary costs at the border are on average about 15% of the value of the trade. That's a big number. And if you're a landlocked country and you cross two or three or four borders, that's a much bigger number. So again, I'm trying to introduce, I guess, a little urgency to not just to the need to change domestic policies, but the need to move quicker on reforming trade policies. Of course, trade openness, it's a, it's a necessary condition, but it isn't sufficient. If we open markets, we create a potential opportunity. We have still done nothing unless there's a capacity for a supply response. And again, as I think David has pointed out earlier, in many developing countries, there is not a sufficient capacity to respond to new opportunities. So it's going to take more investment. The framework conditions that I talked about earlier are very much a part of that. But there's some other things that we can, I'll skip over those, that we can do as well to make it more possible, more feasible 
to generate benefits in all countries, at all stages of development, for market opening. And it's the kinds of things that you all understand very well. First and foremost, investing in people. If you're not sure what to do, invest in people. Education and skills. David has talked about technology transfer. I think for the developing world in particular, this is very, very important. For other parts of the world, perhaps it is a bit more about science and technology and pushing out the productivity frontier. It's about investing in information and communication technologies in all countries. And sometimes it's about bricks and mortar and strategic infrastructure. Improving innovation systems, not just investing more, but putting that money to work on things that are needed, so, which requires a greater focus in agriculture innovation systems on the demand side. What is it that producers want? What are the particular needs of smallholders, for example? And I think an incredibly untapped resource that's available to all of us is the scientific information and the knowledge about innovation that's available from other countries. And the opportunity for international cooperation in this respect, I think, is immense yet underutilized. Whether you talk about sustainable intensification, I think that's the FAO phrase of preference or climate smart agriculture, which I think is the phrase of preference of the World Bank. Using available land, water, and biodiversity resources more efficiently. And of course, because prices are gonna be more volatile, risk management is more important, perhaps looking forward than it's been in the past including for consumers and, and vulnerable countries, net food importers. But I, I don't want to be prescri prescriptive. I want to end on the note that this is about creating framework conditions, as David has said, for a responsible private and public investment in agriculture, including and in particular in developing country agriculture. With over 800 million people in the world hungry, with finite resources, there has to be an urgency to move away from these commodity type programs which are acknowledged to be relatively inefficient, relatively ineffective and relatively inequitable, towards more productive investments in, produ in improving the productivity capacity of agriculture going forward. So thank you very much for listening and I hope there's a little bit of time for questions.